Welcome. You're listening to the Good Girls Don't podcast with Ashley Ray and Verity Mansfield. This is the podcast where we smash those rules that we've been taught to follow both as men and women and burn the damn rule book. We're tackling the big issues and the issues nobody wants to talk about and we'll be fiercely feminist about it. This podcast is about inspiration, education, compassion and being the change that you need to see in this world. This podcast is for the trailblazers, the freedom fighters, and the soul igniters, and all the women just like you who are ready to break the good girl rules and be heard. We acknowledge the traditional custodians of Australia and its First Nations people on which this podcast is produced and consumed. We pay our respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. Get ready for the revolution. Hello, Verity. Actually, I'm still not sure I can talk properly. <laughs> Neither am I. That's why I thought I would stick with really simple words right now. Simple sentence structure. We just had the most insane conversation with possibly the most incredible, inspirational human being that Ash and I have had a privilege to interview. Can we just put out there that this is not a competition as well, by the way? <laughs> no, we love everyone we interview. But we also do need to say before we start that this is a very emotional episode. There is crying. And it can be, there is crying, but there's also very confrontational issues that may trigger other people. So we just need to put it out there. And there's a pretty very high level of swearing as well. (laughs) Yeah. So look, uh, you know, maybe definitely make sure your headphones are working and just be prepared that this is emotionally possibly it's just a really tough subject that we're talking about today yeah and please listen to this episode first before you do include your children we are talking about abuse uh, sexual abuse and female genital mutilation yeah it's a big topic but i think you know, we're so honoured and really humbled by the conversation that took place. And I think you will be too, because we had the space to really cover so much and unpack so much around it, rather than just trying to understand the mechanics of what it is. We really unpacked all of the trauma and all of the things that go around it that, that mean that FGM still exists and is growing in Australia. So we probably should tell you who we actually spoke to today and who's completely and utterly still in our heart. Uh, so today we spoke to Kahija Blatt and she is a high profile, passionate and inspiring African Australian woman. She's an award winning human rights activist, an entrepreneur, an inspirational speaker, a facilitator, a philanthropist and a mentor. Yes. And Khadija provides advocacy training. She speaks on domestic and family violence, sexual health, racism, human rights, mental health, migrants and refugees, and cultural diversity through her cultural consultancy, Khadija Blah Cultural Consultancy. She's also the founder of the only clinic that does this kind of work in Australia called Desert Flower Centre. It's the first centre in Australia and the Asian Pacific region that specialises in providing holistic, comprehensive, gynaecological, urological, reconstructive surgery and trauma-informed care, guys. That's really important, trauma-informed care for women impacted by female genital mutilation. And this is a woman who gave an incredible TED Talk about five years ago and, you know, within 72 hours it went viral and there were millions of views within 72 hours of this TED Talk being released. And we were absolutely, absolutely blessed and honoured to have been able to have Kahija with us and spend time with us this morning laughing, crying together and celebrating, you know, our power as women that also join together in, you know, the sadness that does exist as women and, you know, how much our sensuality and our bodies are controlled and the fight against that. It was an incredible, incredible conversation. 
Uh, we got off the podcast and completely just burst into tears, even though we were already crying on the podcast. Um, it's the first podcast that yep. either of us have cried in. Um, and even Kahija was crying herself. It was a really, really beautiful, really, really moving. And you know, these are just some of the points that we covered. You know, we covered how trauma as a child impacts our self-esteem, our identity and our outlook on life. And you know, we are speaking to an amazing woman who suffered female genital mutilation as a young girl and how she has recovered and how she's built this incredible legacy behind her and continues to build a legacy behind her. Spoke also about owning the choice to take back our power after abuse, especially around abuse that we did not consent to as women, uh, how we make the transition from victimhood to survivor and why the daily work of forgiveness and resilience are so crucial and necessary in healing. Yeah. We spoke about why women need to give themselves permission to own their sexuality, to own their pleasure and to own their clitoris. And you might see a hashtag forming on Instagram, clitoris warriors, we will be making it a thing and you'll understand it once you've listened to this <laughs> podcast. You might also be making clitoris cupcakes, uh, a bake sale for everyone. So you have to listen to the podcast and figure out how to do that. We also discussed why the statistics have risen from 800,000 to 200,000. You mean 80,000? 80, 80,000, <laughs> sorry, to, to, to 200,000. Over the last five years, these, these are statistics of women who have survived female genital mutilation within Australia. This is not about overseas. This is not about another culture. This is not about anything. This is about Australia, what happens in Australia and what we can do in order to eradicate female genital mutilation and how we can all be aware of the warning signs that are happening and what to do. Uh, we also talked about why the husband stitch and labiaplasticity are forms of genital, uh, female genital mutilation. And why as white women, we must step up and own this conversation because FGM transcends race, it transcends gender, it transcends culture. It happens in our own culture. We're not even aware of it. And most importantly, we talked about the importance of Kahija's work with the Desert Flower Center and why we all need to help raise $200,000 to make her work a thing to continue it yeah to help women these these 200,000 survivors in Australia to get them the help the psychological the emotional and the physical help to, to rebuild their lives and claim back their power yes and I think you know it's such a big conversation I mean you will I mean we've said you'll hear us cry you'll hear us laugh you will hear beautiful humor punctuated throughout the whole episode but as well what I think was really interesting um Verity and I have shared this a little bit on social media but for those of you who didn't see it um we both knew about Khadija for years we both read her story or had come across her story in the media for years and I personally like for me I came across her TED talk not long after it was released on YouTube and I actually watched her TED talk over and over again over the years. And I've always found it inspirational. I've always found it funny. I've always found it very educational and really courageous. And she's been a huge role model for me. And Verity actually came across, you'll hear Verity talk about this more specifically, a magazine article about her story. And when Verity and I sat down together to plan out Good Girls Don't Podcast for 2020, and I said, I think we really need to talk about FGM in Australia, we need to have this conversation. First of all, Verity called it female um, circumcision. So I didn't really understand what she was talking about and she didn't know what I was talking about. And then we figured it out. But, you know, Verity started talking about this article that she'd read, but she wasn't sure who it was by. And I knew who it was by, just, yeah, I had to find her name again. So we were sending each other like links and stuff to, to this person that we were like, is this the one? Is this the person that we should talk to? Um, and then we both realized it was exactly the same person that we were talking about. Like we'd never spoken about FGM before together. We'd never discussed it at all. And then all of a sudden we're all like, oh shit, same person. We've come across her at different times in our lives well before we both met. And here we are today. You know, I think it's a really beautiful confluence of I don't know what you want to call it. Like, I just feel like it's an incredible moment, at least in my life, to be able to have this conversation with her. 
and, and to have Verity here as well, part of it. It was just beautiful, absolutely beautiful. And at every soul level possible, we really do employ you to listen to this podcast. Keep some tissues handy. To keep some tissues possibly handy, but also to talk about their staff. Um, and, you know, talk about it to your children, talk about it to your husbands, talk about it to your brothers, your uncles, uh, your sisters, your parents, your mothers. And, you know, if there is anyone out there who is looking for a motivational, inspirational speaker, uh, we found one for you. <laughs> we found one. And especially if you're in Perth, we need to get Khadija to Perth so Verity can meet her. <laughs> well, I'm extremely excited and very honoured to now say that please stick around because you have all of this and so much more coming up in just a moment on the Good Girls Don't podcast. Welcome to the Good Girls Don't podcast, Khadija Blow. How are you? Hi, ladies. I am good and I'm excited for this conversation. Oh my God. We're so excited. It's uh, We are so super excited. So I was just saying to Ashley, and I was just saying to you before, I read an article about you years and years and years ago in Marie Claire. And I just remember, it was, you know, before I had children, I remember just putting this magazine article down in my lap and just crying and just feeling like having all of these feels and this, this empathy and this outrage and just this, I guess, feelings of horror about what does happen to women around the world but not just around the world you know within our own country as well so i know that ash and i are just absolutely honored and just feel so blessed to personally have you here to sitting with us and having this conversation i mean i've never had a crush on a celebrity but you would probably be my first celebrity crush <laughs> <laughs> And that has made my 2020. We can move along now. It's not cancelled anymore. We, we have arrived. That's it. We have arrived. That's it. Okay? I'm here for it. I'm, I'm just here for it. Ashley, so filled with love for you. So we've just been watching your TED Talk, which yes. is such a powerful TED Talk. And one of the things I really want to honour you for is that you have this beautiful, crazy energy and this mad sense of humour that you bring into a TED Talk about female genital mutilation. And it's something that I know so many people are going to be looking at this episode and thinking, this is going to be a really fucking heavy episode. But yet you have this beautiful lightness and this humour that makes it feel safe to have this conversation mm. and that we're not all going to be, you know, crying and heap on the floor at the end of this podcast. I mean, I we was. We don't know yet. <laughs> <laughs> I was at the TED Talk. But... <laughs> no, and that's okay. And I think usually when people do have conversations around violence against women, all forms of it, including FGM, there is that assumption that it is going to be very heavy because it is a heavy topic. It's a very painful topic. But I, like you said, though, what I have found in my 18 years of advocacy see in this space whether it's fgm domestic and family violence child abuse is that you know we can be lighthearted at the same time while discussing these things we can't find the humor somewhere i i can find it at the bottom of the barrel i find it <laughs> But, you know, like most topics, if you're going to communicate it to the world or to an audience, I think one has to really reflect, what is the best way for me to do this? When I was preparing for the TED Talk, to be honest, I didn't even know that TED Talk was going to be that big. To this day, I didn't actually know what TED Talks were when they invited me to do the TED Talk, first of all. I had to go Google it. I'm like, oh. And even then, I'm like, oh, it's just another speech. It didn't occur to me what a huge momentous thing was a to be invited but that the power of ted talk that people were obsessed with them i must have been living in another like, cuckoo <laughs> land because i didn't know um i got that I, I got to canberra and i still in phantom the the magnitude of what i was about to do i was pregnant okay i was over it everybody was fucking up i was just like people need to leave me the fuck alone i just need to birth this human to come out of this out of me I'm done with being invaded by an alien. Like, I was over it. So, you know, forget that I'm about to do a TED Talk. I just wanted a snack and put my food up, okay? <laughs> and then we got to the rehearsal stage. Everyone is rehearsing their speech. And I'm just like, this must be really serious. What are these people know? <laughs> And they're like, Kenija, can you, can you go practice? I'm like, you do know whatever I say today would not be what I say on the day. They're like, what do you mean? I'm like, 
I just speak from the heart. I actually don't know what I'm going to say. I don't know that what that comes out is what's going to come out. So you actually had no speech written? No. Or rehearsed? No. That is incredible. No. No. Talk about vulnerability. That's amazing. No, that it has to come from my heart. I'm not there to impress anyone. The aim for me is not to sound like the smartest person or... I don't know, the agen- those agendas are not there. It's just, I, I, my goal is to be authentic to my mission and my values. I am that girl child who experienced FGM and nobody was there to protect me. There are millions of other girl child who have nobody in their corner. My goal is to stand there authentically in my truth to share that to the world and be a voice for those girls because they're voiceless. Everything else was meaningless. And I knew the words would come because it, I was going to be true to me. So it will come. It didn't need to sound perfect. It didn't need to sound a particular way. It just needed to be the, the truth. It just needed to be honest and real and real. So on the day when I got up and wore my white outfit to balance out the heaviness that was about to come, <laughs> look at me in the white, peace alive. Peace alive, people. Peace alive. With a bit of red shoe, see, pop of color. Fire is coming as well. There will be fire coming along with this thing. Um, and, then, you know, and then, you know, of course, being an African outfit, honoring my heritage, that even though I was about to constructively criticize something that was practiced in my culture, it didn't negate that I was proud of my culture and that, you know, I'm a proud African Australian woman and their beauty, there's so much beauty in my culture, regardless of this one act, there's also still so much so good. Much. And, you know, there's power in those symbolism. So by the time I stood there and had that microphone and I looked into the stage and there were all these people like, oh my God, Jesus, <laughs> this is serious. Don't forget. <laughs> but forget all of that. I just went, it's time to share my heart. And it was vulnerable. It is a vulnerable thing. And I got off that stage. I was like, what the fuck just happened? <laughs> What the fuck? And I remember before I actually did my, my speech, there was a warning given to the audience. Most of the other speeches didn't have that. Mine had an, a caution, a warning that it potentially could be too much if people wanted to leave. Because, and you know, mind me, I don't think I remember anyone actually getting up, to be honest, because I was looking, I don't think anyone actually yeah. did that after. You know, people coming to me and crying, well, people were just bawling their eyes. I wanted to cry, they were crying, but. I am still amazed at the impact of something that was, what, 28 minutes. I was told it should be 15. <laughs> but, you know, I just kept on going. And they couldn't edit it because they, they didn't know I had, like, three different endings to the same TED Talk. They're like, oh, where do we stop? Where does this actually stop? Just let the whole thing go. Just put the whole thing up. It's fine. But, yeah, it's, it, it was amazing. People did expect it to be heavy, and I did expect people to cry, and I did sort of expect that it might be too much. But I have been amazed at the miracle yeah. of the fact that people found me so funny uh, and found it so, I guess, able to be palatable to some extent, even though it's the most horrible thing I was talking about. Uh-huh. But that it has been so well received. Like, how many years now? My son is five and I was pregnant. So, six years in total since that, that TED um, came out. And, you know, immediately, I think a day or two after that TED talk, it hit a million views. In 72 hours, it hit a million views. That's huge. I was talking about the genitals of little girls. You know, girls, yeah, follow me here. That is not the sexiest topic. That is not the, the genitals of women. People obsess over them, but when it's harmful, when it is um, not helping us, when it is not healthy, we don't talk about these things. And there was this black pregnant woman talking about the genitals of little girl pleading for action and and somehow in there she managed to make jokes about various things that you, you, people are like should we laugh are we allowed to laugh it is funny <laughs> but what is going on right now like this roller coaster of emotions but the world responded to it that's the power of our voices and i could not have foreseen that like i said i had no speech prepared I just love it so much because I think there's so much when we come to like really heavy topics like this, I think unless you're a survivor of something like this or or something else that's equally as, you know, not great, there is real humor and comedy that you can find. And it's very powerful in the healing process. 
And I think it helps invite people into the conversation. So they feel okay. They feel that little bit more comfortable to be able to digest the conversation and to be able to be a part of the conversation. Mm. Oh, definitely. For sure. Um, so it's really, really powerful. And I think one of the most powerful things also that came out of it was, I guess, and maybe because of your humor was, and the way that you presented it was your resilience that you weren't a complete mess. You weren't, there was no victim there. Do you know what I mean? It was just this beautiful, powerful woman who had owned her story. And I mean, you even spoke about, you know, you joked about waiting for the apology from your mother. And, you know, Ash and I were even talking about that. Like, how do you, you know, that we've had, you know, lots of people have had shitty kind of childhoods and hold so many grudges against their parents for not letting them date a guy or go into that disco or for telling them off when they got a tattoo. And your experience was so much more than that. And yet, I don't know, there was just this beautiful humanness that just came out and, and this resilience. And I think that resilience is what earns you so much respect and, and your courage. It's just... It's captivating. And I think that is what people need in this world mm. are these fierce women who don't sit in their victimhood, mm. but who stand up and continue to speak out despite of what's happened Thank to them. You. And that is power. And I Thank think you know, Ash and I have had a lot of conversations, and even this morning we did a podcast about women and pleasure. Mm. And you know, the clitoris comes up and you know, it's such a it's such an important thing, I, I guess, for women to be able to own their bodies more than ever. And yet women themselves don't give themselves permission to own their bodies. And here you are as a woman who had, you know, who had violated in the most horrific way, and yet you still find so much pleasure in this world. Yeah. And that is just, like, you have so much to teach all of us. <laughs> I know. I just want to put my hand up and say, how the hell did you do that? Like, I can tell you, girl. Let me tell you, girl. Uh, it doesn't come natural. It is you know, trauma is a hard thing. And that's what we're talking about here. It's actually trauma. You know, when you've gone through trauma as a child, um, you know, it, it changes your development. It, it impacts your, um, I mean, this happened in my formative years as well. You know, it impacts your outlook in life, your self-esteem, your identity, every area of your life is impacted. So we can't even downplay that. Like that is huge. And it takes years and time to even comprehend the damage that was done and, and, and the impact of it to reconcile that to oneself. And then hopefully yeah. gloriously, you can come through the ashes. But as we know, not everyone gets through that journey Prop, you know, in that in that way, in a very straight and linear line. And when you're talking about abuse that also happens in the hands of a carer, these are people who are meant to protect us. There is a nuance to that as well. The very people who are meant to protect you, care yeah. for you, who are meant to make sure the world doesn't harm you, when they make that choice and abuse that absolute trust and I guess sacredness of parenthood and hurt you. Yeah, that is a wound. I mean, that's a scar. To be honest, it doesn't heal. It really, it doesn't. It doesn't actually go away. But you do find, make it, you can make a choice though. You can make a choice. And I have had to make that choice every single day, single day of my life since I realized I had experienced FGM. The choice to take back my fucking power. That's what it is. I didn't give my mom permission to have me mutilated. I didn't give consent to be mutilated. And she took something from me. She violated me. She made decisions on my behalf. She, but you know, and I couldn't control that. I couldn't change that. I couldn't protect myself. But now I take back that power. I take back that power she stole away from me. And I choose to channel the anger. Oh, there is a lot of anger, girls. The anger, the pain, the pain but I channel that into something positive, into action, into making sure it doesn't happen again. So there is a lot there. And, and my hope is that other survivors will see an opportunity to yeah. seek help because I think you can't make change and get out of victim to survivor mode. And that's what I have transitioned. You can go from victim to survivor and they're two different areas. You know, you can't do that journey 
of transition if you haven't done the healing, if you haven't owned what has happened to you, um, heal from what, maybe even sit with it for a while, then heal from it. And then you can decide if you want to be part of the change or that you just get on with your life. Because not everyone has to be an activist. That's completely fine. Some of us are more built for it than others. I'm fine with that. But it is a journey, ladies. The resilience is a daily work. The, the process of forgiving and finding pleasure. You were saying, actually, the pleasure. Oh, I yeah. find pleasure in, in so many things because I've had to redefine what pleasure means. I've had to redefine what my sexuality looks and feel like when it's not the norm, when it doesn't fit. The, you know, it doesn't fit the stereotypical, I guess, image. And I think in my TED talk, you realize I talked about growing up and going to high school and seeing all those <laughs> magazines talk about sexual health and never anyone mentioned that not everyone has a clitoris and white men struggling apparently to find the bloody clitoris. <laughs> Some women not even knowing they have a clitoris to begin with and girlfriends of mine who don't bloody do anything with their clitoris. I'm like, what a waste. <laughs> You're not here. Yeah. That's all you said. <laughs> You're not using it, I'll borrow it. Can I have a clitoris transplant? Give it to me. I'll show you what to do with that shit. You could set up a charity to give me, you know, all the unwanted clitorises in the world. I would do that, you know? An adoption you know, process. Uh, maybe I should do, I should try that. I should find a surgeon and ask, can we transplant a, 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 a clitoris? Some people don't <laughs> use this. They don't want it. Okay. And can we please bloody help men find it? Do a map. It's there. Find it, get to it, don't ignore it. It's the holy grail. Get to it. Get to it, find it, love it, honor it. <laughs> I know, right? But as we know, though, ladies, pleasure comes in so many forms, and you know, being able to just find pleasure in the simple things, the sensual things, you know, uh, and enjoying that and redefining what that looks like for each one of us. I think that is a yes. journey we all have to go through. And I feel sad that we live in a society, though, that does not encourage women to own their sexuality. The patriarchy essentially is built to make women feel yeah. ashamed of their sexuality, to treat female sexuality as taboo and dirty. But in fact, you know what it is? At the heart of that is that they actually are scared of our sexuality. They're scared of what it means when we fucking own that shit and we demand. I'm pretty sure there's a lot of dudes that think vaginas have teeth. Yes! <laughs> <laughs> yes! <laughs> if they're it's legit real. scared that we're going to like clamp down on them and like rip it off or something. Uh, it's ridiculous, right? So we have been conditioned. We actually have to, and that's why we have to go through this journey of decolonizing, you know, a, a pleasure and sexuality as women and fighting the sexism and the patriarchy that says there's something wrong with, with it. And But that's a journey though. And not all women will be able to go on that journey. And some have had, you know, um, things happen to them that may really make that even more difficult, like rape or sexual assault will definitely impact and FGM will impact um, that journey. But you know what? It's 2020. Women are like, fucking hell, we're over it. Waste the dildo, waste the rabbit. Give it to me. Um, you know, we're out here doing tantric massages. We're breathing into our, what's that, yoni down there. Yoni, we, yeah. we are doing it all, okay? And we're yeah. claiming back. And I think there is a result, there is a, a movement of us claiming that area that for so long has been pushed aside and ignored and called dirty and called not appropriate. We are not, look, we have no time for that, okay? We have, yeah. we have no time. Fuck the patriarchy. We've got no time for that. No. It's so true though. I remember talking to my teenage daughter just yesterday and we were talking about masturbation and I was just literally having to tell her that she has permission to enjoy her own body. And she just looked at me and there was this point where she's like, you're giving me permission? And I'm like, babe, this is your body. Like you get to do whatever you want to it. <laughs> um, and it was just such a really interesting moment where I was like, wow, like, as mothers, we really need to tell our daughters that they have permission over their body yes. because this is not a message that they're, they're told. It's not a message that is sold. Yeah. Men, are, men, we've got young boys out there in primary schools who are being told they have permission over a woman's body, yeah. but we've got young girls who do not understand, who have been told that they don't have permission over their own body. Yeah. It's, it's fucking, it's, it's ridiculous. It's the most crazy that shit crazy thing that goes on yes it's not fair it's fucked up 
on so many it's levels. It's really fucked up on a lot of levels, on every level. And then we wonder why we have so many issues in society. We wonder why married women no longer want to sleep with their husbands. Mm-hmm. We wonder why there's domestic violence. We wonder why we're not seeing men stepping up. And, you know, we've got a male politician in the federal parliament who told one of our other um, guests on our podcast, uh, Holly Ann Martin, that uh, domestic violence was a women's issue. And this is a federal member of parliament. And it's like, what the fuck? If the men who are running this country believe that and think that way, mm. then, like, how the fuck are things meant to legally change? How do, how do women have a chance? And I think this is why it's so important that women... There's so many women as well that are talking about turning their back on politics yes. because they're finding there's better ways to be heard, you know, and you're such a beautiful example of that, of having this voice of we don't fucking need these patriarchal institutions to get our messages across. Nope. No, no, we don't. Look, I think men at the moment, and it's sad that we live in Australia particularly, we know like on average one woman a week is killed due to domestic and family violence yeah. and for those who are not killed because sometimes we don't talk about those who don't get killed the lifelong impacts of living with emotional physical sexual financial technological spiritual mm-hmm. i mean if every day different types of abuses are, are created and we learn yeah. felting with you know pretending to put a condom take the bloody condom on that's not consent it it, it, it amazes me the the amount of danger and threat women and girls are exposed to and we live in a first world nation mind you and even in that we know for Aboriginal women the rates are also higher due to colonization racism we have our lgbtq plus uh sisters and they have also you know challenges in there we have our new and emerging refugee and migrant women who then have you know racism and religion intersecting and then sexism into their lives it, it, it's a it's a landmine out there but, but we have had enough the women are saying we will not be put in this position anymore we we have the right to walk out in the street and not be sexually harassed we have a right to live at home with our partners and for them to not be the greatest threat to our lives we our daughters need uh, deserve to be online and not have pedophiles fucking commenting on their 13 year old's picture you look hot fuck off yeah. we deserve to not be sent fucking dick pics Keep your dick to yourself. Oh. Nobody wants nothing of that. Nobody wants it. Nobody's interested <laughs> with it. I, I warned. I Nobody. warned men. I did a lot of online dating, and I always warn men: do not send me a photo of your penis because it will go viral. <laughs> I will share that shit, and we won't be going. It's amazing. We will be pissing ourselves laughing. Like you think that we feel one way about it. <laughs> we don't. We don't feel that way. We're not. I like, don't understand yeah. where along the line the patriarchy decided that that was a good idea. Yes. <laughs> it's entitlement. That what that is what it is. It it's is fucking it is. entitlement. That's the heart of it. Entitlement to touch, entitlement to just say stupid shit. Just this entitlement to access to women and women's bodies. That entitlement. And we need to yeah. stop that. We need to challenge that entitlement. And you're right, we need to talk to our daughters. I think that conversation, generational conversation, and I've seen that in my family and we're having a whole different conversation, me and my mom, you know, but it is, we need to have that conversation, like you were saying before, about autonomy, about empowering our little girls to know they own their body, nobody has access or, or right to it, uh-uh, yeah. and that they can't say no, and that it's okay, and they will not be punished, they don't need to be good girls even the language around good girls why don't you hug uncle uncle is a nice guy you don't want uncle to be upset fuck uncle i'm not hugging you i don't need yeah, to hug not you. my job to look out I, don't the I don't need to sit on your lap i don't i don't feel right about it so i shouldn't have to like we, we need to start the, the, the you know challenging these things within our family unit because honestly i feel like the family unit is where the most change can happen, it's yes. possible, and we don't utilize it enough. I mean, for example, I have a son. I don't have a daughter, I have a son, he's five. When he was two, you know, he stopped breastfeeding around one, one, and then he's like, okay, no worries. Slowly, he's like, okay, I don't need your milk no more, but I still want to hang on to these boobs, they're fabulous, why not? <laughs> okay, boy. I had a message for him, I said, well, I loaned them to you for nourishment, now you don't want said nourishment. Our contract has now been <laughs> no, so, no, they don't belong to you and you don't have access to them. I would prefer if you kept your hands to yourself. Thank you very much. And I said this to my friends. They go, isn't that a bit much? I'm like, no, no, no. It's not though. It's a valuable lesson for us to have, me and him. 
That's and isn't that the point? We, we keep saying that these things are too much. It's not. It's not fucking too much. Women dying is too much. Women get it's, women exactly. it's too much. You know, you know, not knowing consent and then hurting somebody is, is too much. But talking in an age-appropriate way around, I said to him, well, it's mommy's body. And now that you don't need the milk, I, I just want it back. And I don't think you need to touch it. When I say to him, Sammy, can I have a hug? He says, uh, he says no. And I've t- told him and taught him that he can say no. He now understands that, you know, it's a give and take. I, he needs to respect my body and autonomy to it. Likewise, I respect. He was two when we were having this very simple, keep your hand away from my boob. I had to swat his hand a couple of times. You know, like a fly, move that hand away from my boob. But <laughs> it's only got the point. He, you're, you're not coming back for milk. There is no milk. You say you don't want milk. Let it go. They're mine now. I need to get them back up and, and perky and tight somehow. <laughs> Okay, let it go, boy. Let it go. And slowly, we went from talking about that kind of consent to hugging other people. And whether if, if you didn't want to hug somebody, that's okay. You don't have to hug mm. them. But Sammy, if you see a girl or even your friend Leroy at kindy, say hey, Leroy, do you want to hug? Ask before you just jump. Hey, Mary, can I hug you? We were at the airport a couple of uh, months ago. I was flying out. And he saw this little girl, he rushed to her. And I said, Sammy, Sammy. Looked at him like, say, can I please hug you? And he asked, I said, and it, it, for people who were saying, oh, that's a bit too much. Is it? I have trained a five-year-old to understand the concept of consent. His body belongs to him. Other people's belong, bodies belong to them. We have 50 yeah. old fucking men out in the streets out here wanting to touch everyone willy-nilly, thinking they're entitled to it, thinking they have the right to Huh. I don't know if you can, if the five-year-old gets it, they should get it. They should get it. It's never too early. It's never too early to start conditioning and training our little kids, our daughters and our sons and having these conversations. And you build on it as the years go by. But I thought that was the breastfeeding was a perfect example, you know, example sitting there for me to utilize, to teach him something, you know? So, yeah. No, it's brilliant. And it's so true what you were saying, you know, that whole thing about sitting on, you know, uncle such and such's lap, that is exactly what happened to me as a child. And I was expected to sit on his lap and to bat my eyelids and to please him Mm. and ended up being sexually assaulted because of it um, for years. And this is the thing that we don't get, you know, it it, it fucking happens. Yes. Um, And, you know, we just need to have so much more awareness around boundaries and around women's bodies and, you know, letting women own their bodies and young girls own their bodies yes. and let grow, you know, teaching young boys as well that you don't have, just because you have a penis, it doesn't give you any more rights than someone who has a vagina. Nope. Um, it's, it's crazy stuff. Mm. But just going back to, because one of the things I was really interested in as well was, you know, this whole conversation about, you know, female genital mutilation and, um, you know, we have these preconceived ideas that it doesn't happen in our country, Mm -hmm. that it happens, like you were saying, in Africa, the Middle East and Asia. Mm -hmm. So I started talking about this the other day and there was a lady who lives in Canada and she was saying there was a massive, 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 you know, conferences happening in Canada, Mm -hmm. teaching people about, you know, uh, physicians and medical doctors um, about the ethics of female genital mutilation. Yeah. And it's like, holy fucking shit. It doesn't just happen in countries that we we think, you know, have these issues. It happens in our own backyard. I mean, you, I think it was in one of the articles that was saying, you know, it was 80,000 women are female survivors in Australia of female genital mutilation. Yeah. Is oh really my god, I didn't realize it was that many. Actually, it's worse it's now, really ladies. It's higher than that. It's now 200,000 women have been a uh, survivor. 200,000. 200,000 women yeah. ago. And just last year, I was doing some research. Last year in New South Wales, three men, the High Court prosecuted three men for female genital mutilation. This isn't something that happened 10 years ago. This isn't something that happened in another country. It's in our own fucking, in one of the most you know, economically advanced states in fucking Australia. Yeah. Last year in the high court. Like, it's a fucking problem and no one is talking about it. And that's what makes us so angry. It's like, and I I just have, um, I mean, you know, one point that, yes, it's in our backyard, 
But I'm really curious as to, you know, is, is racism a part of the problem in terms that as white people that take up the majority of space here, we go, well, it's, it's a, I mean, and I'm going to know this is probably going to sound offensive, but is this just a black person's issue because we're white and we don't do that shit? Yeah. And so it's like, well, it's not our problem. But then that's the fucking same thing as saying, as men turning around and saying, well, this just happens to women. So it's not our fucking problem if you get abused or raped. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like, well, hang on, is this a societal problem? We're all responsible. Yeah. And I think not until men stand up and help women and men agree to become feminists and admit that they're feminists and actively actively support causes mm -hmm. and not to white women actually stand up and embrace their coloured sisters and say, hey, we're fucking fighting for you here too because this is against all women, mm -hmm. not just against you. Will we actually see change? Oh, yes, girl. Let me break it down, sister. Oh, right? please do. Oh, okay. Please <laughs> do. Yeah, this, this, we're getting now to the details of this. <laughs> the nuances of this. Let me take us back a little bit. Yeah, let us backtrack. In the 1980s, you know, um, okay, backtrack even more. FGM predates Christianity and Islam. It was practiced all the way back in the Egyptian days. That's how far this practice has gone. And for the listeners, I would like to describe what FGM is as, before we continue, actually. In, yeah, because, yeah. So people actually are like, what, what is FGM? Nobody said what the fuck are they talking about. What are they talking about? FGM, We've made a big assumption there. <laughs> yeah. FGM stands for female genital mutilation or sometimes referred to female cutting. And some people consider it also female circumcision, but not to be confused with male circumcision. And I would love to answer that later, how they're different. But those are the terminology that you hear. But FGM is the terminology I prefer because I feel that it's the best name and title to describe what truly has happened. Cutting, I think, minimizes the actual act. So FGM, for those who are listening, is when the genitals of little girls are cut, so the, the clitoris or the labia, the lips that we all have down there are cut as well. And, you know, you have three different types. Type 1 FGM is the hood is pricked or cut. Type 2 is the whole clitoris is cut or and sometimes one set of lip as well is cut. Type 3 is when everything that is cut, the clitoris, the labia, the, the lips. And then the woman is sewn up so she has a tiny, barely hole to pee and to have her period. A woman with type 3, when she goes to the bathroom to pee, this is what it sounds like. Drip. 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 Takes forever. When she has her period, oh most of it is inside. It's barely coming out. You can see the impact of that. So those are the three types of FGM. In type 3, sometimes you have a situation where nothing is cut at all, but the woman is sewn up still. And on her wedding night, her husband may open her up. But if she lives in Australia, she can access um, our, my center, which I'll talk about later, the Desert Flower Center Australia, or go to a hospital and actually get opened up so that she, she's able to have less restrictions that, down there. So those are the three types of what we're about to talk about, FGM. And why does it happen? I actually want to answer that, because after you hear a description like that, you want to know why. So that yeah. FGM, yeah, yeah, yes. So can I just ask a question? What, how, if a woman's genitalia gets sewn up and she's bleeding within herself, what the fuck happens? Like, how does she not become infected and just die? She does in some situations, especially if she's in a third world country. She can get infected. She can die. She can get septic. She can get sick. And that's, you know, the health side effects of FGM are lifelong. I mean, I'm having shivers because I think certain people don't truly comprehend how vicious and brutal we're talking about. We're talking about a four-year-old little girl. Can you imagine? And you just you have, you know, people have daughters listen, and I'm sorry, but can you imagine somebody pinning her down and taking a knife or rusty scissors and going to town in her private part, all in the name of she needs to be a good girl. We want her to be clean and pure and not have sex. The life impact of that, the consequences, if a girl is lucky to not bleed to death while she's mutilated, she goes through shock, trauma, infections, constant UTIs. If the FGM is done in a group setting, she may contract HIV, hepatitis B, 
she may uh, have infertility or have high risk pregnancies later on in life. And of course, the psychological impact, this is such a brutal form of abuse and such a brutal uh, disregard for a child's welfare and autonomy and, and rights. I mean, the, the, the evidence is just all there. So when we say FGM, for everyone listening, that is what we are talking about. One of the most brutal forms of child abuse and it's gender-based. It's because they're born a girl and because they're born a girl, they seem to be less and less value and their sexuality, even at the age of four or five or even a newborn baby girl, apparently that sexuality is such a threat. It, need, it needs to be eliminated instantly and very quickly in a very brutal way so that we can live in a society where we have clean and pure girls who stay virgins until they get married. But meanwhile, men and are out there running and they're sticking their penises everywhere they can find, stick it in, but they are yeah. not expected to be pure and clean and stay virgins until they get married because their, their value is not dependent on, the, on what's between their and legs, but values the put on us. Bullshit, isn't it? It's like women have to take responsibility for men's inability to control themselves. Exactly. And it's like, that's, that's just so fucked up. Like this, it's not our job to have to shut ourselves down and sew ourselves up in order so that men can't rape us or have sex with us when they choose to, huh? or that there's something so horrific about the female body, which we know it's not horrific. We oh. know that, and this is the thing you were saying, that the female body is actually so fucking powerful mm. that our, our womb space, our sacral chakra is so fucking powerful and so full of creative energy and life force energy that there's a fear there where, where it, it threatens, I guess, the patriarchy. This, it does. this male concept and they have to fucking shut it down. Oh, yeah. And, oh, and they're finding ways, very brutal ways to shut it down. They're shutting it down as soon as you're born. I know newborn babies have gone to FGM. So they're shutting yeah. it down. You were just born. You, you haven't even breathed enough air yet into that little precious child's lung. And they're like, somebody get in between her legs now and eliminate that fucking threat. Because our sexuality... It's, it, it, it's, it's this obsession with it to control it, to minimize it, yeah. to, to page it. Because when you think about it, you know, ladies, the penis does one thing, right? It goes yeah. in, you, it, it gives you sperm, you make babies with it. Okay, fine, whatever. The vagina. Now, that is a glorious specimen right there, okay? <laughs> and then, you know, the universe found it worthy that we will have this little knob just sitting there. So do nothing else except give pleasure the men are threatened by that they see the penis as being what if it, it's a threat to the penis the, the clitoris as being a threat to the penis because the comparison between the two oh well we can't have that now we really can't have women being out here having this thing that gives them complete pleasure they don't even need us you know they don't even need us they just need that thing and they're happy they can go meanwhile <laughs> well, you, know, you know it's it seems interesting just the, the, the threat that that is seen to be as and you know when you put it in a more international context you know you now see that the reasons for fgm you know and why it's part of the you know violence against women spectrum it applies to all these other things all these other acts of sexism telling women what to wear yeah. You wear a short skirt, you know, uh, telling women to cover up, telling women how to behave. You know, if a woman has five partners, she's a slut. Meanwhile, a man is out here, 10 partners, he's a stud. This constant obsession to control women's sexuality, to control the bodies of yeah. women. The porn, everything is tucked in. Everything has been shaved off. You know, God forbid women look like women anymore. Things have been shaved off so much. People don't even know what a, a normal labia looks like down there. Nobody, people don't even know that it's, they hang. They come in different shapes and size. And, and it's all beautiful. It's all normal. It doesn't need changing. But yet, that's the society we now live in. So I think that is such a good way to connect FGM to even more broader forms of sexism for people to see. It's a spectrum. You have FGM maybe on the extreme end, but then start there. It started with we want clean girls, we want pure girls. It started with, you know, a woman needs to behave like a good girl, but she's a slut. And she, that it starts there, what you wear, what you don't wear. And you have this spectrum and then it gets to the brutal end, FGM, domestic violence and all of that. But I want to take us back to, FGM and in Australia and, F and this concept of, you know, the most, the question I get asked the most, where does it happen? Like so everyone assumes Africa, Middle East, Asia, 
I have a history lesson for our audiences. In the <laughs> 1980s, in the Western world, when, you know, the medical field and men, the patriarchy were like, women are hysterical. You need to control them. What we now know to be really most likely was PMS. People were just fucking PMSing at the time. Yeah. They actually used to have clitonomy. The clitoris of women were actually cut. And this is in the Western world. And people don't talk about this and they don't remember it. But they say, this I'm saying, the next to the racism we will talk about later, because you have asked actually a very brilliant question. It's racism at the heart of why FGM is not addressed in Australia. And I want to trace them back for people to understand where this all started. It, start, it, it happened in the West. It happened across the world. But there is not an acknowledgement that FGM has happened in the West way before immigration and people came from across the world. So in the 80s, women, white women, Anglo women were having their clitoris actually caught just because they, under the guise of their hysterical, they were maniacs, they, they needed control. Yeah. God forbid, in some instance, it was that a woman was masturbating. FGM was used to actually stop them from touching themselves. Because once again, the influence of religion and patriarchy saying women do, are not deserving of pleasure. Only men are, which God forbid, we can't be self-pleasuring. But a boy can masturbate 10 times a day. Oh, he's fine, he's a boy, that's healthy. So FGM was also utilized in the West to actually curb fem control female masturbation. Then wow. the other way it was utilized was to quotation mark here, uh, uh, cure lesbianism. So he hello, homophobia. So once again, that was another angle used. Right now, across the world, especially in the U.S., lots of white women are coming forward who are remembering being little and their parents taking them to clinics and having their clitoris cut because, A, they were caught with their hands between their legs, you know, touching as most people, girls are. You're fascinated with your body. You're experimenting. You, you know, you're growing. Boys can do that, but not girls. The consequences for these girls was a trip to a clinic and getting their clitoris cut. The consequence of oh, liking no. girls or being seen holding a girl's hand was getting cut. That is the history of FGM in the West. And that has never stopped. It's continued. And a woman in, uh, in Melbourne, an Anglo woman, and this is, and this claim is going to be shocking, who found her daughter touching herself and she took a scissors and cut her clitoris. <gasps> this is Australia, just interstate. Okay? <sighs> oh, I oh yes. that was visceral. I know. I, know. I, I want people to have context so that yeah, we need it. The, but we need it. We're not yeah. educated. We don't talk about this shit. We don't even talk about women's history in schools. I'm constantly listening to my my girls are 10 and 13. So one's, you know, coming to the end of primary school and one's just out of high school. And every day they come home, I'm like, what did you learn today? Did you learn anything about women's history? My daughter came home yesterday and she's like, oh, we've just touched on the witch hunts. Oh, well, did they talk about it like it was a myth? Did they talk about it? It was real history? Yeah. We didn't really, we didn't really talk about it. Nope. It's like, what the fuck? Like, where is women's history? <laughs> no, it, it, it's, they're hiding that part. Too busy talking about the men who were heroes of the day and blah, 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 yeah. and blah, blah, blah. It's like, fuck off. Nobody got time for that. Men have a way of centering themselves. Our history is inherently sexist. It, it, it always prioritizes the experiences of men and even when it does choose to showcase women's experience it's usually very negative and in a way that doesn't actually do us any justice at no. all and that then brings me to the next two other acts that are, are considered fgm and are fgm in the western world have you heard of the husband stitch no oh yes when you Vaguely. when you have a baby and you tear and then the doctor's like would you like some extra stitches to make your vagina tighter for your husband is that what you're talking about? Yes, but in a different way. So traditionally, the husband... Actually, was, actually, at the moment, it's going, what the fuck? <laughs> I thought this was something completely different. Oh, my God. Oh, it, it's bad. But where it stems from, though, it's once again, remember the, the key words before were entitlement, men needing to control, thinking they can just have access to a woman's body and make decisions on her behalf. So traditionally, yes, and you are right though, women can be asked and they consent. But what is actually more predominant is that they don't consent. Is that a woman's had a baby, she's had tears down there, and she's been sewn up, and the doctor decides that she needs extra stitches, girls. This is the key word, extra, that she doesn't actually need. It's not medically necessary. So whatever tearing she has has already been stitched up, but she's given extra to make her tight for her husband. Somebody's making this decision. A doctor is making this decision to pretty much say that let's make you really tight so you, for your husband's pleasure. 
Let's tighten you up. Never mind, this may hurt you. Never mind, you don't need it. Never mind that you're not asking actually this woman for her consent. You're actually just making this decision. Women have only found that later, this is what has happened to them. Lack of consent. Oh my God, I never, the even thought about, I never even thought about that as a form of abuse or female genital mutilation. And yeah. I know it happens. There's we no talk consent. About, women joke about this all the time. Yeah. And yet we've never, ever, maybe that's white women being in our naive privilege, have never, ever made that leap. And this is why I like to give these sort of conversations, really take people back and set that context in that. We think FGM is this barbaric act across the world in a hut somewhere with those other women who can protect themselves. We other the other women, different from us. This got nothing to do with us. Ladies, the patriarchy is fucking real everywhere across the globe. The way it manifests and looks for different women, that's different. But the acts and, and the reasons are all the same. Whether you're in the Middle East, being to, forced to wear the hijab, or then cru crucify when you choose not to wear it regardless, or wear, and you're still raped even though you're fully covered up for those who are like, oh, we, we, she got raped because she, she was wearing the short skirt. Why did the woman in the hijab then get, get raped? She's fully covered up, asshole. Or you go to Africa and you have women who are still trying to get clean water. You know, we have FGM, we have forced marriage. And you come to Australia, we still don't have gender equality. We, we, we're still not paid equal to, to men. You know, we, we had a prime minister for fucking women. What did he do for us? We still have one woman a week dying. You go to the US, do you see? We are all in this fucking battle. Together. And what we need to do though is stop the nitpicking and, and the isolating yeah. and the we are better than, than them. It doesn't surprise me a lot of Anglo women who talk about um, uh, the husband's stage and laugh and not really see the nuance of that experience when there's no consent, when somebody's once again, the patriarch is saying, we will control a woman's body, we'll make her tight for her husband okay. so he will have pleasure, we will intrude on her body. Isn't that why FGM in the, in the other sense is literally done? And people laugh and think, oh, and now you also then have women who are choosing to have it. And we can discuss the internalized sexism. We can, we can discuss women having autonomy and making choices on their own. That's fine. I, I, I'm all for women do what they want to do for themselves. But we do have to acknowledge that we don't always see acts as being bad or horrible or compare it to FGM or, because we think we're civilized. We think we're, we're in Australia. Everything is clean. We will never uh, subject ourselves to such an act but the husband's stitch would meet the definition of FGM. Another act yeah, in the West the that would meet the definition is labiaplasty for girls under the age of 18. Oh, oh my God. Yeah. The doctor connecting in my head. The doctor, exactly. Oh. They still rise of labiaplasty for girls under the age of 18. And I'm saying under the age of 18 very specifically because I'm a feminist. I'm all about what adult women can do what the fuck adult woman wants to do with her body. You do you, boo-boo. You do you, sister. You do whatever you want to do. That's fine. Your body, your rights. But when we yeah. talk about children, when we talk about kids who cannot consent, when we talk about the kids still developing and people making decisions about altering their bodies for non-medical reasons, fuck, that is unacceptable. So last year, I read an article about this white woman who had a daughter. She was probably 13. She decided that her labia, the lips, one was just too long. She took her to a surgeon to get that nipped for her. Non-medically necessary. I want to know why she was so close to her daughter's vagina, first and foremost. Shall we actually, why was she so close to it to even see that they were uneven? That's a mistake. <laughs> but why then decide that that's what needs to be done? It's normal that your lips are not even. Like, I don't think anyone has even lips, technically. I actually don't think so. But to then take that drastic action of taking that child to get surgery that they did not need, for what? So they will look a particular way because we're told this is what you need to look like. People will not yeah. consider that. But that is FGM. You, that meets the requirement. FGM is any altering of the female genitalia for non-medical reason. If her lips were chaffing, hurting her, and really, you know, maybe, you know, she had pain and it was just rubbing too much, fine. But she was perfect. There was nothing wrong with this beautiful girl. Her body was the way it was meant to be. Yes, she was subjected to surgery, so she would fit some prototype somehow. 
So, oh my god! FDA, and they, yeah, yeah it's not, they are saying that it's like the fastest growing medical procedure in the world. What does that tell you? We now have young girls, thirteen year olds, fourteen year olds, fifteen year olds, actually demanding it for themselves, watching porn, and seeing you know surgically made vaginas, vagina that have been altered. Everything is tucked in. Everything is neat. We now have girls, young girls, feeling really uncomfortable in their body, feel like they're not normal, requesting the surgery, requesting to have it done. How scary is that? You know, that's terrifying. And we don't talk about this stuff. We don't talk about the nuances of these acts and the practices and how they all come under the umbrella of the fucking patriarchy wanting to once again control women. It's marketed us. We're told every advert on TV is how you need to change what will make you pretty and sexier. So, you know, you, you can be loved. So the guy can like, send a like message on Instagram to you or, yeah. you know, you can be helped on Tinder. Constant messages are sent our way to say, we need to change. We need to be different. We need to have bigger boobs. We need bigger asses. We need more lips. We need this and we need that. We don't unpack these nuances. But my point of all of this is to say these acts that are, have been practiced in the West but never seen under the heading of FGM is because there's an inherent racism in the way the definition of FGM is actually understood by most people. It seems to be FGM is an act for the uncivilized. It's the Black women, it's the Middle Eastern women, it's the Asian women. When I unpack that for people and say, actually, this is a universal issue. Recent research says that FGM is practiced in every continent except Antarctica. Because the penguins... Because there's no people there. <laughs> but not the, penguins don't have feminists. the penguins are feminists. They don't want to change the clitoris of the other penguins. They're like, we love the, the clitoris. Fuck yeah. That's why they have lots of babies. They make for life as well. I think I read that somewhere. They back in the, they, you know, they, they, I think this needs to be the title of the episode. <laughs> Good girl and her talk. Yeah, penguins are feminists. Yes, penguins are feminists. They, it's the only continent that is not fucking with the clitoris. That's like team clitoris, team clitoris. The penguins, you know, see? But it's in every continent. It's not in Russia. Everywhere, every day, I will read an article. It's in Sri Lanka. It's in Russia. It's in Latin America. It's in a, I'm like, oh, my okay. God. This is so huge. To, so to understand... FGM, we also have to understand how intersectionality comes into this. Oh. That's incredible. I love this because <laughs> you've just explained how this plays out intersectionally. Yeah. Like how do white people experience it as opposed to other people? Yes. Like, but it also that, shows how ignorant yeah. we are and how blindsided, no matter how feminist we think we are, then we're like, fuck, we've just been blindsided again by the fucking patriarchy. Yes. Yeah, and you're like, oh, you God. <laughs> And it is, and you know, and that's why it's been my mission to really utilize the media in raising awareness. I want every GM to be talked about in every family, in every home, because I understood there was just this lack of understanding of where FGM comes from and why. So I've talked about, you know, FGM being practiced then in the West. So then we do have migration. We do have people who do come from African Middle East and Asia where FGM is practiced. And they come to Australia. Mm. But like I said, they're not the ones bringing FGM to Australia. FGM is already in Australia. But now, all of a sudden, we're united as women now, right? Everyone listens like, okay, we're all in the FGM boat. Okay, we get it. Okay, yeah. It now makes sense. This is something that transcends race, gender, religion. This is it. Yes. And I have to actually preface that, you know, in the LGBTIQ plus A community as well, I've had people who are intersex who think that they, they're, what's been done to them, the surgeries when they're little, may actually meet the requirements of FGM as well because they don't consent to having their genitalia changed or altered when they're little. All of a sudden, yeah. you see why the need for intersectionality, looking at different forms of oppression, racism, uh, sexism, homophobia, ableism, how all these battles you know, are perpetrated and the acts manifest for different women but we, it's still under the umbrella of we are fucked by the patriarchy tell this is what needs to happen to us. So I want that unity somehow. And it's been quite sad that FGM has not had the attention it deserves because of this racist notion that it only happens to black little girls. It has nothing to do with us. It only happens to the uncivilized people. It only happens across the world. And then so, well, it's their problem. Well, it's their culture. Oh, well, I heard they no. like it. No, 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 no. That's not the case at all. And we shouldn't have a racist interpretation of the definition of FGM. It never said it was one particular group. It was very clear and very simple. 
but the way we view this act can be racist. And I have seen and I've said to people, if the girls who were getting cut were predominantly blonde and blue eyed, I think FGM would have been tackled in Australia a long time ago. And they yeah. can be blonde and blue eyed, according to my definition, what I just explained to you. They can be blonde and blue eyed, mind you. They can be brown hair and, you know, nice brown eyes. They can be white. They can, and the, the evidence is there. But because they're not the majority or they're not seen to be, um, because Anglo Australians, this is not something that happens in the white world. Well, we don't care. Let the black people do what the black people do. Let them do what they do. It's not who we are. It's just what it is. And that has impacted the fact that this hasn't been tackled properly. And even when it's tackled, it's tackled from the way of we are better than them. We need to make them see that in Australia, we don't do this. That doesn't help anybody. It never helps anybody when you're trying to discriminate and you're trying to have superiority complex. But what the message you send to your sisters from those communities that we're not in this with you. We don't support you. Yeah. We are better than you. We, we are not in this fight. This is your fight. And somehow we are above it all. And then when That's I, flew, so when I just explained to you minutes ago, yeah. they, 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 there's like a mic drop and everyone's like, mind blown. Uh-oh. We're all in this. Shit. Shit. Okay, we must do something now. Why couldn't we have done something before, even before you realized that thou I'd, I'd not have judged in the first place? Like, this is what I say. Why do we judge so much? So. Yeah, I and I think we do. We forget how many of our stories are really interconnected. And this idea, what you were just saying before about feeling like we have to, we think that we're separated from it and we're not. Nope. It's just, it's such a, a, I don't want to say a false belief, but it's like we've been tricked into believing that we're separate from it and therefore it's not our responsibility. And yet when you start talking about it and we start seeing like all those nuances and we start understanding like, oh my God, like there's so much more to this. Mm -hmm. It's you like you said, with there's no separation here. We're all in this together, whether you fucking like it or not. Yeah. And you know, this is one of those things where we need women to stand up for women. Yeah. And we need men to also stand up for yes, women. We do <laughs> I've got some really, I think, um, my brain being the way that it works is like, oh my God, this is horrific. So um, let's say that someone listening to this podcast maybe has someone in their circle who is considering this. I don't know that we do, but let's say for an example that that's happening. What can we actually do? Like what's, do we call do we call DHS and report them? Do we call the police? It might be a really dumb question to no, ask. No, no, no. It's not dumb at all. If we're talking about a child under the age of 18, is that what you're referring to, a child? Yes. If we're talking like if there's a parent listening who yes. might be considering engaging in this with a kid, yes. I mean, we call the police, yes. we call DHS. I can help That's you what with we that. Do. It's not a dumb question at all. In fact, it's the best question you could ask me because when it's all done and said, people do forget the heart of FGM is little girls, little children who can protect yeah. themselves. And I would like to give you a bit some stats. Last year, a research was done with some pediatricians in Australia. They said they mm -hmm. were seeing, seeing babies present at hospitals as young as five months old with injuries consistent with FGM. Oh my God. Let me repeat that again. Babies as young as five months old showing up with injuries consistent with FGM. I have childcare workers calling me saying when they're changing nappies at childcare, they're seeing babies with injuries consistent with FGM. FGM is illegal in every state in Australia, every state. It is under the Child Protection Act in every state in Australia. If anyone okay. is aware that a child is at risk of FGM, your responsibility is to call Child Protection Services to investigate. And what people need to know about FGM is that unlike other forms of child abuse, because FGM does form, is one type of, of, of child abuse, it doesn't need repeated action in that it happens only once. You only yeah. need one opportunity. So if somebody becomes aware of an information where maybe a parent has told you, I am going to cut my daughter, or somebody said, oh, I'm going on holiday to this place and my daughter is going to, this act is going to happen. And I will discuss uh, very quickly what the warning signs of FGM can be for people listening. So if you get see any of those at yeah. flags, you might not. Oh, please do. It's, Go for it. So we want people to call child protection services because you only need one opportunity. The parents or whoever is intending this needs only one chance for the act to be done. 
So we really need to be proactive and preventive because you don't have a pattern like other abuse. It's not like you get, you know, a smack here and a smack there. Then we see the evidence, then we see a mark. This is one chance, one opportunity type of abuse. So when somebody has information, it's so important. They really act immediately. I want people to be more overcautious. I want you to stand in the, in the side of being overcautious because mm -hmm. the result yeah. of FGM, I, I don't want you to say sorry to a little girl. It's not going to fix it once it's done. No, no, there's nothing we can say. There's nothing in the world we could do to fix back what's been done. So I want you to protect instead. I want you to rush and in good faith, if you have information, call child protection services so they can make this not happen. And in reality, by actually reporting it, you're actually protecting those families because they haven't committed a crime yet. You, it's making sure we have healthy families. The mom and dad are home, the kids are safe, everyone is safe in essence. But what mm -hmm. are the warning signs of FGM? So when it's practiced in, I guess, in communities like the Asian, African, and Middle East and uh, uh, culture, what you need to be mindful is when people say they're taking their kids overseas for a holiday, a special holiday, usually it will be term, and that they're going to become a woman. Keywords, special holiday, they're going to become a woman. Something different is going to happen, it's going to change that. And when you also have sudden holidays that haven't been planned, if you're a teacher in a classroom, you know, all of a sudden, this student has to go away in two weeks on a, on a special trip overseas. And they'll and be you may gone for like that. a yes. month. Yeah, exactly. You have to worry about that because what is going on? If, you know, if they come from a community that practices FGM, something you can check online, you can call me in my work, you easily will be able to verify, okay, what's going on? The teacher might, may be able to call the parents and actually have a chat to investigate further and they have enough information called child protection services. If a kid has come back from holiday, you realize that they're squirming in their seat, they're taking longer in the bathroom. Remember type three, how they pee? Like just one drop and then one drop. Yeah. They will be there forever. So if they're constantly in the bathroom and they're taking forever, that may be a sign that FGM has already actually happened and you still need to call child protection services anyway. So holidays, that's it. But also sometimes what we're learning is that people are not flying in parents to come to Australia to actually do the cutting, people to come here to do the cutting for them. So grandma is visiting, there's going to be a special holiday, I'm going to be a woman, there's going to be a big, there's going to be a party, it's all for me, we might want to look into that. I want us to also be mindful that, you know, Malaysia, Indonesia, Singapore, FGM is actually legal and they are our neighbors. So people wow. nearly can just get into a plane, go over there where you have billboards advertising FGM. You go to a clinic, it's like a menu, you choose and the girl is cut. It's very medicalized in Asia, it medicalized. So it's in a clinic with health professionals who have taken an oath of do no harm, but apparently this doesn't apply to FGM, are cutting little girls. They actually have adverts, ball, billboards outside. So when you think of our geography, it really raises, you know, concerns. And last year, I think we had a, a man who was, uh, not last year, maybe a couple of years ago, this case never made the news. And you were talking about cases before. But there was a man who, who took his daughter to Bali um, to have FGM done, and he was found guilty. So technically, we've had three successful prosecutions in Australia. I'll come to that later. Please ask me about the cases, because you brought it up before. But that, that oh, was I plan Bali. to. <laughs> the daughter was taken to Bali. So holiday... Wow. Um, people can be take, kids can be taken overseas. They can fly in people here to do it. But also, and this is going to blow people's mind, people can find people in Australia who are willing to do the cutting. In Shepparton, we know of a clinic that does male circumcision. Under the table, does female genital mutilation as well. We know a woman in Queensland who charges $1,000 to cut girls. So people then travel interstate. We know a person in New South Wales who, in housing trust complex, cuts girls. We know doctors who are willing to do the cutting uh, themselves. So when people sometimes go, well, we don't see it a lot in hospitals. Where is it? Well, if you're doing it, by, if it's been, you have your own private doctors taking care of it, you won't see it necessarily in a public yeah. hospital you know, setting. So it is happening in Australia. It's happening in our backyard. It's happening in, in our housing bus. It, it is happening here. People are finding people who are willing to. You talk about cosmetic surgery. You talk about you know, surgeons in that area. They, they follow different rules for example, and they do different things. People can find people who are willing to break the law, and it is breaking the law to do that. If a medical professional practices FGM, it is actually a crime. They're not meant to do it, but sadly, ladies, we know for some people, everything's about money, so it really makes no difference to them. 
So, oh and then gosh. the other side, uh, sign that FGM may be a risk factor for a girl, beside the holiday, people flying in to come and see them and do the cutting, is that if, them, if they come from a community that practices FGM, they're high risk. If their mom has had FGM, she is definitely, it's going to happen to her at some point. If she has an older sibling that, that it's happened to, she's just next. She is just next in line. So, yeah. Wow. It's just, yeah. I know. It's actually oh, yeah. not I just like trying to process all this. Yeah. Um, so how does that work then? Like in terms of, and this is us in our ignorance, like if, you know, like if, um, like for instance, like I've been abused and that therefore my, I guess, ideas and philosophies around my children are like, I will literally murder anyone who even thinks about touching my daughters the wrong way. So how, how does that work then in terms of you were saying like, you know, if mothers have experienced and been subjected to, um, FGM, how, what, is it because of the the belief and the yes. pressure from yes. the male community yes. that it's, it's not a will? Is it? No. I want to really, this is such a great point you've just made. For, for, for so long, people said, how is FGM a result of the patriarchy? It's women who are doing it. And everyone's like, oh yeah. Men are like, leave us out of this seat. It's not our fault. We get blamed for everything. I want, you to, I want to explain why that is the case. Because I think people want to understand how does a mother who's gone through something like that then do it to her daughter? So that's the yeah. million dollar question. My mom had FGM. My grandma came home, took her and her sisters, and took her to the bush. The, she, FGM was perpetrated against her. My mom then perpetrated FGM against me. Now I say to my mom, it's not going to happen to my daughter if I have a daughter or any of the girls in my family. So it's stopping in my generation. When I ask my mom, why? Why would you do this to me? You went through this. Why would you do it to me? In communities where FGM is practiced traditionally, not considered in the West in, in a different way, A, there's low literacy. So education and awareness is not there. B, F, there's a huge propaganda with FGM where it's marketed to, to the community as something that's good, that's healthy. In those communities, if you don't practice FGM when it's the norm, you get ostracized, you can get killed, your husband would divorce you, your, your children might be taken away from you, and it can still be done, your child might still be kidnapped, your mother-in-law can kidnap your child, your, your husband's family, it can still be done. But the key thing here I think we need to understand is that this is actually about internalized sexism. Yeah. These women have internalized the sexism and the patriarchy where they have been told to be a good woman this is what you do yeah. to belong and there are consequences. And we all know this ladies, right? There are consequences when we women don't act what society says is good for a woman. Let, let, we are, we are slut shame. We are, we attack. There are consequences when we step outside of our box. So apply that same here for this yeah. woman. If in those comments, if FGM is the norm and you choose to not do that to your daughter, you are ostracized. You are cut off. You are, you're in danger of being killed. Your, your children, your daughters can't actually get married because people will marry girls who haven't had FGM. People don't want to eat with you, sit with you, play with you. There's a cost. These women right. are being held hostage. There is a cost to not doing what is yeah. needed. Women who have run mm -hmm. away have left everything behind trying to escape with their daughters to prevent this. That also has a cost because they are out there. That has a cost. Women have also internalized this from the perspective of, well, maybe we are empowered. Maybe this now gives us more self-control because they've been told if you call off the clitoris, now you have control. If you have a clitoris, it will just control you. You're going to hump the tree. You're going to fuck everything that moves. You have no control over yourselves. Where did they get this from? Men applying the logic that they have no control over their fucking penis, that women have no control over their body. So let's cut off a bit of it and then you'll be yeah. fine. So this idea, so some women, and this is why my TED talk is called my mother's strange definition of FGM, that she thought she had empowered me, that I would not be in control of my body. My clitoris would not control me anymore. And that that was a good thing. It's also believed that if you cut off the clitoris, it will make um, uh, childbirth easier. So you're being prepared to not go too much pain. That is not backed by any fucking science, but that is so to women as well. 
So my mom's generation walk around thinking that they actually are empowered, that they have, this is actually a good thing for them. Brainwashing is real, ladies. People get brainwashed into believing all sort of things. I know women who think we don't need feminism because we have had equality. I know women who think feminism is terrible because they can't be allowed to be women anymore. The world is full of crazy ideas, okay? It's full of crazy <laughs> ideas, okay? But here we are. But I think, and, and, and I know this to be a fact across all across the world and everywhere FGM is practiced, there is actually never been a malicious intent for this woman. And that's the sad part that what makes it harder, even when I look at my mom. I know she didn't intend to actually hurt me in the sense that she wanted to hurt me. She genuinely believed she was doing something that was good for me, that she was actually protecting me. And I think in the TED talk, I talked about this, we had this conversation and she said, and she's like, I was being a good mom. It was my job and responsibility to do this. So you'll be clean, you'll be accepted, you will not go through too much pain in childbirth, um, and you have control over your body. And she gave this example, if you're fighting with your husband and you don't want to have sex, because you don't need sex, you'll be fine. That's actually now something that you have power over. Why would yeah. she say that? In my mom's context, back home, where women don't have much, uh, let's say, what are the options? They're low socioeconomic, husbands, the patriarchy, the head of the home, they thought this actually gave them some power. I can choose not to have sex. I, this is my only way. This is something I can actually control. It's like, oh, I have power now. It's like, no, mommy, you haven't empowered me. You may have sort of take that in and think that's the case. You haven't empowered me because when I have my period, I have to take one week off school. I'm admitted to the emergency every fucking month, shooted with morphine uh, injection because that's the level of fucking pain I'm in. I'm on the floor crying. You give me Panadol. Everything on the, uh, from the pharmacy doesn't work. I have to be taken to the hospital, be there. How is that? How am I empowered, mommy? Like, how am I empowered? And when being told I couldn't have children, how was I empowered when you, that choice was taken away from me? When my pregnancy is high risk, how am I empowered? Like, I'm failing to see this. But when mm -hmm. I talked to her and we, when I started having some of those side effects, she said to me one day, you know what, Khadija? I had terrible periods too, just like you. I mean, I, I wasn't living here where I could have access to doctors and stuff, but I had a really bad, heavy period and I have all these other symptoms. She's like, you know, I never thought it was because of the FGM. I'm like, what do you mean? She's like, there's no connection between the two. I never realized. Just seeing you going through this, obviously you know the research and you're seeing doctors here. I never knew that what was done to me when I was little is what was causing all those side effects. Oh they my God, the level of education know. that must have they taken place. No. That what yeah. happened to them as little girls, years later, you know, you have people can't have kids. You have women who bleed for months. You have people, you know, have sexual dysfunction. They, they don't see the connection. The low health literacy and low literacy, there is not a connection made between what happens as little girls to their adulthood. So the propaganda continues. FGM is good. Nobody can prove otherwise. So when I was having those symptoms, it was the first time the dots was joined to my mom that her act of thinking she was protecting me by mutilating me so I would be all these things to belong to that society actually had consequences. She never factored that in because she never knew. No, I'm not making excuses, ladies. No excuses are being made for the act, by the way. I want everyone to be clear in the audience. There is no justification for FGM, but we must try to understand how this come to be and see how do we have women going from generation to generation, continuing an act that is so brutal and harmful, we need to understand how they don't know is, is one of the explanations. Do you think that that's linked to a trauma response as well, where quite often when something so horrific happens to us, we have that amnesia? And oh, we, yes. Yeah? Oh, yeah, definitely. We have that disconnect. And I think in my TED talk, you realize that I said, I didn't remember that I have had FGM until years later. I literally blocked it out of my mind. It was so traumatic. I couldn't remember. I didn't remember the act. I, I even thought everyone had the same vagina as me or vulva as me. I thought mm -hmm. it was normal. I had no memory until it was triggered, uh, triggered by the picture I saw in that, in that center. No yeah. memory. And when I talk to doctors about asking about FGM in their history taking, so for any doctors listening, please ask about FGM in your history taking. To all women, don't discriminate, just ask any woman. If it doesn't apply, she said it doesn't apply, but if it does apply, you're able to capture that and support her. And some, I've had women who are like, I don't remember. And the doctor's asking them, they're like, I don't know. And when they have been examined, it's been found that they've had FGM. They have no memory of the oh. actual act to them. 
that makes it also very easy, isn't it? And convenient that then if your partner or, or you're being pressured to have everything done to your daughter, you don't actually remember what the bloody hell did happen to you. So now yeah. you're like, well, off we you don't go. remember There's anything. Not, you don't remember what happened to you. you. You don't have the connection that this is going to cause all these side effects that you actually having, but you have no connection with it. So I've sat in the rooms with grandma, two, three generation mothers, their, then daughters, their grandkids. And I said, explain to them the health side of, F of FGM. They burst into tears. And the first time it happened, I was like, why are you crying? They go, I have had bad periods. I couldn't have sex with my husband. So then he ended up beating me up because he thought something was wrong with me. I couldn't have children. Or when I had them, they died. Or I have had sisters have died in childbirth. Because of, we didn't know any of this were connected. We had no clue this thing would cause so much suffering and hurt. We were told this was a good thing. It, 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 we, we, we were strong. This is what had to happen to us. Gen three, four generations in a room, all crying, all victims of the same exact act in one room. No justification, but yeah. Lord, does, isn't that, does that just not make sense at all to you? Can I ask a question? And I don't know how tough this question is to answer, but in terms of like even just, you know, even your own experience with your mom or even experience of sitting there with, you know, three generations of women, all sort of being like, fuck, like we didn't know this. And, you know, is there, what, what happens? I can go, I'm looking at it from a mother's point of view, I suppose. Like when I've done things and it's hurt my children and then I've gone, oh, fuck, I didn't realise. And I've had masses of guilt and shame. Like how do, how do we support women who, you know, have had daughters and have, you know, force their daughters into female genital mutilation, how do we also support the mothers so that they don't fall into the shame and into the mm. guilt because they didn't yes. know? I think we start with empathy. And, you know, people should understand, I have a very clear line when it comes to violence against this women and girls. I have zero tolerance of it. I, I believe there is no justification. Religion, yeah. culture, there is never a justification. So I want to preface that so nobody misunderstands the conversation Definitely. that happened. No justification. There is not an excuse for it. Whether you know you're doing something wrong, you don't know just end of story. It's bad. It's yeah. terrible. Now it's happened though. So where do we go? The damn it, it's done. Mm -hmm. I look at my mom and I see a woman who genuinely thought this is what I needed to do for my daughters. But she hurt me. She hurt my sister. I have to live for the consequences of this every single day for the rest of my life. Okay? That's painful. That, that, that is real. She also has to live with the consequences of what happened to her. She then also now has to live with the consequences that I, her daughter, believe what she did while she thought it was good, but it wasn't good. And she finds that hard to accept. Because she's like, well, I, I didn't mean to hurt you. And I, didn't, I, I wasn't meaning to hurt you. And I did the right thing. Why are you angry with me? I'm angry because regardless of the intent, you hurt me. And I want you to acknowledge the hurt that was caused. That is what I want you to acknowledge. I'm, I'm sorry I hurt you. I'm sorry I subjected you to this. I'm sorry I sentenced your life to this act. It's all I've ever wanted to her. And guess what, ladies? Last year, I actually did get an apology from her. Did oh you? my God. Yes, an update from the TED Talk. She apologized and said she is very sorry. She did not know. And so I, mean, I did not know what it would do to you. What I an did amazing amount of growth and, and learning for her to come to that place as well. It took a long time. It was taking us 18 years. It took a long journey. Yeah. And for her, and even in apologizing, and I need to say this, she went back to still saying, can you please not talk about FGM? Because of the shame. Yeah. She thinks every time I speak about FGM, it's a shame for her. It's a shame. This is why we don't have many survivors speaking out because it comes to a cost. You are putting out there what has happened. There is a, there is a perpetrator, real perpetrator. My perpetrator is my mom. She's there. She doesn't want me to talk about it. James, we're not going back to it. It's like, I will talk about it because it's not actually about you, mommy. It's actually about the little girls who need to be protected. We're just an example in a story that's so mm. in across the world. It's not actually not about you. And this it doesn't come from a place of hate. I actually looked at her and I said, I want you to actually know. I'm not doing this to hurt you. I can see why you may think I am because you're like, oh my God, can't she just accept my apology? Like, I, I didn't mean to. Can't she just let it go and stop? Okay, hide my shame. Can you please hide my shame? Leave it alone. Mm, no, yeah. I can't. Because shame and silence is how this fucking continued to happen in the first place. We, I have to break that shame and silence. So a, a woman out there, I've, since my TED talk, the amount of women who have then realized I've had FGM, 
only because I talked about it. Women have gone to doctors now to seek treatment because they now they're like, oh my God, what she's talking about? That is me. If I didn't break that shame and silence, they would have continued to live that way and think that was normal and that was what was okay. So I had to say, I'm like, I don't hate you. This is actually not about you. I'm not fueled by anger or hate. I am fueled purely for the love of justice and that little girls deserve better. That's actually what fuels me. Not you, not wanting to do anything to, to you. So I need you to accept that. But also I can't own your shame, unfortunately. I can't own that and take that on. Yeah. You have to process that and accept that. I, A, don't, ha- I'm, don't hate you. I understand the circumstances that led to this. It's not still acceptable. I wish it never happened. But I am, I've moved on to not wanting to be part of the solution in this. That's what you need to do. Be part of the change. The don't wallow in your, in, in, your, in your shame. Shame is a normal part of life. But wallowing it is not actually going to change what has happened. Trying to gag me is not going to really change what has happened. So for the women out there, the mothers out there who have done the wrong thing, and we have, we're parents, we all mess up, fuck up in multiple ways. Deal with the shame. Deal with the mistake that you made a mistake and it wasn't okay apologize to your child, then be there for them in the journey and be part of the change to change the story. Because otherwise, then you haven't learned from what has happened. Otherwise, you, you just don't give a fuck. But as we all know, yeah. we make mistakes. And all our kids actually do want from us is to say, I am sorry. When we know better, we, we, we do better. And that's what I know better. So I have said, this will not happen in my generation. This will not happen in my family. No fucking more it stops with me we need to now do better this is why i go around and educate those communities i talk to moms i talk to husbands i talk to fathers i talk to brothers do you know the, the biggest group that calls me for help are big sisters bloody big yeah. sisters saying khadija oh my god i realized what happened to me mom and dad are talking about this for my sister it can't happen you have to make it stop it can't happen it can't fucking happen and for the women who are out there who have been pressured to have this done to their daughters, I hear you. A couple of, last year I was in Tasmania. I spoke to a room full of women who have had FGM. And I empathized and said to them, I know you had no choice in this happening to you. But all I ask is that you remember you have a choice now. You have a choice. A diff- you can make a different choice that your parents, moms, and whoever in your family didn't make. And I want you to make a different choice for your daughters. And it needs to stop. Anyway, I left, came back to Adelaide, bumped into a worker from Tasmania somewhere. And he said, he had a lady in a DV shelter, domestic violence shelter, who had fled home with her daughters because her husband wanted her to subject her daughters to FGM. And she remembered my words. You know what, Khadija, I think that's the power and the beauty of you. And this is why every female listening to this episode, and I think we're all quite emotional at the moment, Yeah, your voice matters, regardless of who you are, how tall you are, the size you are, the colour you are, the culture you come from, the country you come from, your circumstances, your voice fucking matters. And you have the power. Anyone listening to this podcast, you have to understand that you have the power in sharing your story of preventing the trauma, of preventing that experience of happening to somebody else. And it is such a gift to be able to pass that wisdom on, to be able to change someone else's story so they don't have to live through the trauma that you have lived through. And when we get to save, and I do really feel we literally get to save another human being, there is something so soul-shaking, so divine, so almost like, thank God I was born, thank God I spoke up. There's a sense of worthiness, and there's a sense of ownership of who we are, our purpose, um, that can never be taken away from you. No, no. And to the survivors out there listening to us, who have experienced all forms of gender-based violence, rape, sexual assault, childhood abuse, all of you. My love goes out to you. I stand in solidarity with you. We stand in solidarity with you. Know that you are whole, you are perfect, and you made, what happened to you wasn't your fault because we all go through that thinking somehow it's our fault. 
it wasn't your fault. And I wish you guys all the best of luck and reach out for support. There is no shame in reaching out for support. You deserve to live the best life possible. And your best life is not behind you, mind you. It's ahead of you. Yeah. Ask for support because I want you to all thrive and live in your truth and your light. And if you feel the calling to want to step into advocacy, step into it because you will make a difference. There's a woman out there who needs to hear your story. There's a child out there who needs to hear your story. So there is power in that. And for those who that's not the best step, you are still powerful. You are still worthy. And by just existing, despite what has happened to you, fuck, you have already won. And that's okay. so all I can say. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. You know what, KJ, is I think it's a really important thing. What can, what can people do? What can women do who have suffered female genital mutilation, where can they go for medical, emotional, and psychological help? I have the answer for that. So <laughs> besides protecting girls and wanting to make sure they're okay, obviously as a survivor myself, I've seen the challenges of accessing proper support in Australia. The medical field in Australia are not well-versed in FGM. They're not culturally competent and inclusive. And women, you know, the shame and the judgment and racism that they, they experience can be horrible. I've had women have gone to, to see a doctor they, you know, they've been examined and the doctor's like, oh my God, holy fuck, what is that between your leg? What happened to you? Like that. And they have then called the nurse and then called the receptionist to fucking come and look between that woman's leg. Highly inappropriate. So I know yeah. the challenge this is women face. I know challenge in, in accessing support. So last year, I co-founded the Desert Flower Center Australia based in Adelaide. And women can come from all over Australia and I will support you. We'll find accommodation, transportation. I'm fundraising at the moment. I need 200000 but we will make it happen to get you access. I have a surgeon who can do reconstructive surgery for FGM. So that will help reduce the scarring tissue. It will help um, soften the tissues down there so it's not as painful. It will reduce pain. It will helpfully enhance sexual pleasure, at the very least, ensure that you're not having pain all the time. We're able to also offer gynecological support with UTIs, infections, anything to do with sexual health. We can support you. Um, we can help you with fertility as well. We have a trauma-informed uh, um, uh, team that will help with counseling. Free, all of this free of charge. We, wow. we have non-surgical op options like laser that can still, you know, rejuvenate, you know, that scar area down there, reduce the trauma, um, allow you to, to just have some sensation, some pleasure. Ladies, there is hope. My aim, and I know nobody can ever give you back what has been taken. Nobody. Nobody can. But what my aim is that we can help you give you back some dignity some respect and a semblance of a healthy thriving life that's it so feel free to contact me if you need more information the desert flower center website is about to go up in a month or two and for those listening who want to help i need to raise two hundred thousand dollars for this woman i don't want money to be a problem for access i need to raise two hundred thousand so any way you can help those who want to fundraise, fundraise. Those who want to do a petition, do a petition. Those who want to do cup, vagina clitoris cupcakes, please go ahead. Clitoris cupcakes are yummy, very yummy. Um, anything you want to do, any way you can help, please reach out. Because like I said before, we need to have empathy. We are all in this together. We all truly are. And if we can reach an arm out to help another woman, that is the most progressive and defiant thing we can do to the patriarchy. That's us saying, Fuck you, essentially. Thank you. Oh, and yes, we will put all of those links into the show notes for this. And we would love to be part of a conversation of how the fuck we raise this $200,000 <laughs> and what we can do. And we will be putting this on all of our social media in so many Facebook groups of, of business women, of entrepreneurs around the world. Um, and Ashley and I would love to find a way of helping to contribute somehow to okay. raising this two hundred thousand dollars. And honestly, he just the the work that you do, the passion that you have, your courage to show up and be so vulnerable and honest with us has just moved us. I don't think Ashley and I have ever cried on a podcast <laughs> um, until today, yeah. and it's it's out of just reverence and honor and 
admiration for your strength, your resilience, your passion. And fuck, we need more women like you in this world. And I am so grateful that you were born, that you exist and that you have used your voice to, to move, to motivate, to inspire and to make this world a safer place, a better place for all females in this world. And as a mother of two daughters, a single mother of two daughters, I cannot thank you enough for the work that you do. Thank you, ladies. I'm just going to second what Verity said. <laughs> Hashtag what she said. Hashtag we're great. You're not great. I just don't have words. So she said it perfectly. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me and thank you for this platform for for us to have this conversation and it will go wide, wide and far. So that's, that's the beauty of this. Hey, if you want to continue this conversation, head over to our Facebook page and be part of the revolution. You can find us at Good Girls Don't Podcast on Facebook. Please note we cannot create change alone. Your support, likes, comments, shares and iTunes reviews help us to give a voice to the insanely inspirational women and the controversial issues that we discuss. If you'd like to be a part of our podcast or if you have an issue that you have a burning desire for us to bring into the light, please contact us. With Fierceness, Ashley and Verity. Get ready for the revolution.